Well, so thankful to be able to come together again. Let's go to the Lord. Father, again, you have shown such loving kindness and tender mercies already. A new day, with it comes new mercies. And for that, we rejoice and thank you because we need them all. Thank you for the privilege of being able to sit under your word, to hear you speak. Lord, to have the, the wind of God, the breath from heaven to blow over us is our desire. Give me grace to teach the truth in love for your great name and for the blessing of your people. Through Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Back in Hebrews chapter 3 today, and Lord willing, we'll finish this chapter. So it will be in verses 12 to 19 today. Hebrews 3, 12 to 19. He says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As, he, as it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt, led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Amen. Powerful word from the Lord. So as we continue in chapter 3, we're under this second great warning in Hebrews still. Namely, the peril of refusing to believe God's word. The peril of refusing to believe God's word. And the writer's already warned against neglecting such a great salvation, which involves this drifting, remember? Which can be a slow fade. You slowly look up. You look up and, and this slow hardening and the freezing of your heart has taken place. And, and you're done for. And the author has just finished showing how the Lord Jesus is greater than Moses. He is the greatest of all. He's greater than the angels. He's the king of heaven whom the angels worship and are commanded to worship. And he's also greater than Moses, which is a big statement for a Hebrew people to say something like that. And he said he has more honor than Moses, as much more honor as the builder of the house has than the house itself. He's the builder. He's the owner. He, he built Moses. He built you and me. It's him to whom we look. And the theme now has been this great reality of entering into God's rest. Entering God's rest. And critically important to this foundational truth is found in verse uh, 6. In chapter 3, verse 6, he, he lays this out before us. It, it's, a, it's a conditional statement. Sometimes we think, oh, there are no conditions. You know, unconditional love, unconditional this, unconditional. But look, at this is a... This is a conditional statement right here. He says how Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. So that's, that's setting the trajectory now about what he's going to say. He's going to start drawing from Psalm 95. But he he has this great concern. He, this pastoral heart of the writer is just bleeding all over the pages. For this people, he's introduced the great doctrine and reality of the perseverance of the saints. It would be the P in tulip, perseverance of the saints. It's critical. There, there is a holding fast that must take place in the Christian life. There's no coasting because that's called drifting. If you're not holding fast, you're going to do what he warned against in, in chapter 2. You're going to drift. 
It's just the way it works. It's inevitable. You're going to hold fast or you're going to drift. And the Lord Jesus told us, remember, he said the gate is narrow and the way is hard. That leads to life. And however, he did promise that he would be with us. He's our Emmanuel, our God with us. And even though it is hard, he will help us. He's our sympathizing high priest, as we saw in chapter 2. He's taken upon himself flesh and blood, our human nature. He knows. He understands you as a human being. He knows the struggles. He knows the, the hardships. He gets it, and he's willing and there to help you in time of need. The Apostle Paul had that great concern for the Corinthians, and I, I think it's the same thing. In chapter 2, verse 11, when he said, But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray. From what? From a pure or sincere and pure devotion to Christ. That is exactly the concern of the writer of the Hebrews to these people. It's precisely the same concern. And being led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. That is the objective and that is the goal of the devil and of sin. That's the goal. So the second great warning passage now, it's it's, it's right before us and he's expositing Psalm 95, the latter part of Psalm 95, 7 through 11. And he gives this example of Israel in the wilderness after they had been delivered from Egypt, remember? Remember? That, that great event, that exodus event, and after they had walked through the Red Sea and saw God's works for 40 years, it says they, the warning comes from the, from the fact that they hardened their heart against God. And ultimately, as God viewed it in Numbers 14, they've, they've ended up despising God, not trusting Him. They've hardened their hearts and they rebelled. And God made a judgment against them right at the border of the promised land. And it wasn't like a little disappointment in them. Oh, I'm disappointed in their behavior. Or you know, this, this is going to work out eventually. No. What was, what was the deal? He basically said, I swear they will never enter my rest. So what's the great, greater truth for us? If we neglect Christ, the gospel, it should be clear, but that's the message and it's what we need to hear. And the truth that came from Psalm 95 that David taught to his people a thousand years after the Exodus, that the king, the inspired prophet of Israel, he's saying, this is the warning and I'm warning you. When you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So it's the same message he gave to them. And today, that's what the Holy Spirit's saying, present tense. When you read Psalm 95, he's saying it. When you read Psalm 34 or the Psalm 33 we've just been in last week, it's the Holy Spirit saying this to you and to me. In the scriptures, it's him saying it. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So verse 12 picks up now. And he says, take care, brothers, Lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. So the writer now, he he masterfully, he weaves in exhortations, uh, expositions. You know, he's he's giving warnings. See that? He's He's taking scripture. He's explaining scripture. And he's applying the scriptures. and And he's from there giving you a way forward. He's a great teacher, and this is what he's doing here. He says, take care. That's one way of putting it. If you're in other translations, it, it may say something a little different, but it's the same truth. It may say, see to it. That's a good way to put it. See to it that there not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, or watch out, or be careful. It's like a parent or a friend or someone who really loves you saying, you know, you really have to be careful here and about this. And what is it? That there not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. 
That's where the danger lies. That's where the problem is. It's, it's in the heart. It's always in the heart. And it, it's not in the, the brain necessarily. As, as that great proverb, Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart with all vigilance. That's God speaking through those Proverbs. That's the Holy Spirit telling you through the Proverbs. Keep your heart with all vigilance. There are things in life you do that with. You'll keep things, protect it, guard it, nourish it, nourish it, cherish it. So you're going to keep this. If there's one thing you keep in life, it's this. I'm not going to let this go. And that's what, that's what God's saying about your heart. Keep your heart with all vigilance. Why? For from it flow the springs of life. From money, money does not flow the springs of life. Or even friendships or other things. It is the heart. From it flow the springs of life. So this is what we keep. And the great sin that arises in the heart is unbelief. Unbelief. Remember last week, Andrew Murray's caution? Never view unbelief as a weakness. It is not a weakness. It, it is the mother of all sin. It, it is the height of sin, as Owen put it. Unbelief. If there's one thing that provokes God more than anything else, it's this right here. It's this unbelief in the heart towards him. And so that's the danger. That's, that's the warning. You remember Thomas, whom, who kind of has the nickname Doubting Thomas? Remember what happened with him? After the resurrection, he was struggling. He said, unless I see him, the hand, his hands and the scars, I will never what? I'll never believe. And then what did Jesus say when he came to him and showed him his hands? He said, Thomas, do not disbelieve, but believe. Believe. That is crucial and, and critical. It was a merciful thing of Christ to do that for Thomas, wasn't it? Believe. That's the answer. So unbelief is not a weakness. It's evil. And it leads to the greatest of evils, namely a hardness towards God, your creator, your maker, the one who gives you air and food and and gives you existence. You're going to harden yourself against him, rebel against him, run from him, despise him. So this evil, unbelieving heart is the opposite of the spirit of a true heart that draws near to God in full assurance of faith, as as he says later in chapter 10. A true heart will draw near to God. It doesn't mean he's perfect or sinless, but there's a true heart towards God. So in the gospel, you know, this this is what the message is. You have, you can have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, he has opened up the living way to the living God and be at peace with him, have communion with him, enter into this rest he's talking about. This holy God, you can be at perfect peace right with him in his presence. And this is through faith. And this falling away is from, as he's saying, the living God. Don't miss those words. The living God. What does that imply? There is no other God. He's he's the only God there is. There are not a pantheon of gods or or millions and millions of gods like other false religions teach. Isaiah, the prophet, in chapter 45, verses 5 and 6, said, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. That's the truth, and that's what he's saying. It's the living God you will fall away from. And that's an amazing thing to think about. If these people go back to even something like the law of Moses, the old covenant, if they're to go back to that, even what they are saying is the teaching of angels, if they're to go back to that from the gospel to that, what's he saying here? You do that, you're falling away from the living God. That's apostasy. That word fall away, that's where the root of apostasy comes from. If you try to go back to the old covenant, which is no longer valid, it's over. It's no longer in play. 
you try to go back to that, you will depart from the living God. Moses would, would say, don't do that. You can't do that. There's a new and better way. There's the living way, as we see, we'll see later in Hebrews. The living way, the better mediator, the better covenant, the better priest, the better king. He's the better everything. He's the living way. So the concern is that not a single person in the congregation have an evil, unbelieving heart. Not any of you. Not any one of you. Because the result is is devastating. What happened? Almost the entire wilderness generation that, that was in the Exodus, almost the entirety of them did this. They apostatized. And the effect of one hard, unbelieving heart among a people is it spreads. It, ha- it doesn't affect just you. It affects everyone. Or it could, has the potential to. So not one of you. There's a singularity here. Not any one, not a single one of you. That's what, that's what we are aiming for here. So the, this falling away is to get you back onto this broad path to destruction, that easy path. One person said, I believe it was Spurgeon, he said the path to hell is a gentle, pleasant slope downwards. You, you think this is a gentle, nice, pleasant path you're along and then you're done. That's the deceptive aspect of sin. You're deceived when you're on that path. So falling away, it gives the opposite results of what he's saying here also of holding fast. There's the falling away, and then there's, there's the holding fast, the holding firm contrast that he's drawing out in here. And someone may have made a confession of faith in the past, and they think, in a sense, I'm good to go, right? Where there's this joy, which, which naturally can come in being a new Christian, that, and the idea that, hey, this is going to be a breeze, This is going to be easy. I've got it all figured out. Well, the truth is, there is great blessing, but there's this truth of needing to hold fast. Because there there can be a season that comes along of, of difficulty. Maybe a great difficulty, a great challenge, a great time of of tempting, or or a real alluring, you know, sin or temptation that, that gets its grips on you. A testing or a trial arises. You use your imagination. There are many things. And then what happens is that confession or that confidence in God, it starts to waver. The the holding tight aspect starts to loosen. And that that is an extremely dangerous position to be in. The grip loosens instead of holding fast. See, sin begins to deceive you're deceived. You're thinking this is actually better. This, this is going to be leading to more happiness or this will be a good thing. Right? That, that's what the, the devil, the serpent in the garden was tempting Eve. This is actually, that fruit is actually good. And it will have good results. See, sin's deceive, see, deceiving. And you believe the wrong things. And ultimately you believe the wrong things about God. Or you become more sympathetic with the world and the ways of the world. More, more in love with the world actually. And the next thing you know, you're hard and cold against the truth. Against God. Against the gospel. So a loose grip won't save. It's like being in a sword fight with a loose grip. Is that going to do you any good? No, I've not been in any real sword fights, but I've been in some pretty good Nerf sword fights with my sons. If I have a loose handle on that thing and I'm going, and they'll, they'll whop and that thing will fly out of my hands. And vice versa, they'll find out, oh, I got to grip this thing better because daddy will he'll, he'll, he'll zip, knock it right out of my hands or loop it out. He'll do something. Firm grip, that's, that's, we have to persevere. Holding fast is crucial. I love the Pilgrim's Progress example. The guy, he had the sword, and it's like after the fight, he, he, it, it, the challenge wasn't dropping it. The challenge was, was letting go. He couldn't get his hand because they were so tightly held to the grip. And so this is the, this is the picture. 
And it's part of perseverance, which leads into verse 13 now. He says, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So exhort one another. This is a vital part of Christian life. What an important part of the Christian life. Exhorting one another. We need each other. I hope we're seeing that here. We need each other. You, you go off on your own, you're not going to be okay. We need each other. And we need to take care of each other. Christians need to take care of their own. Wherever they are, we take care of each other. And it, it's not just either the, the elders that are doing the exhorting. It's, it's, it's a call to all of us, each of us, isn't it? You see that? It's not calling out this is a role for the elders. This is all of us. And this is what loving one another is about. That's why Jesus said it's so important that you love one another. This is how we, we, this is how we know we have passed from death to life, that we love the brethren. So this is fundamental. This, this is the basics. And it's vitally important in the Christian life. We need to exhort one another This protects our heart from the deceitfulness of sin. That's what it does. It's a protection for for all of our hearts and what sin can do to us. And in, in each one of us are called to this outward concern. A lot of us get too inwardly focused, don't we? So a merely inward concern or only being introspective or, or merely introverted, that can be very unhealthy and selfish. If you think about that, it, it's a beautiful thing to see an introverted person being about the kingdom, whether they're getting up and saying something or whether you see them taking action and, and loving or helping or doing something, because you know that does not fit their personality. So, it's a call outward, and the Lord calls us to love and humility. It's going to take that. The Christian life will require that. And it's a commitment to Christ and to each other. If you're committed to Christ, you are committed to his people too. There's no disconnect. It's all of them. And at some point, here's the deal. We will rub each other wrong, won't we? That'll happen. That's, that's just life in this fallen world. Something, something, we'll rub each other wrong somehow. Something, something will happen. So what will we do? What do we do? We exhort one another to love and good works. We forgive each other. We bear with one another in love. We either do that or, or we rise up in pride. We, we let bitterness set in. We let anger take over. And part the mentality is you know I'll just I'll just go somewhere else so I don't have to deal with this if you're really living the Christian life you're going to have to deal with this and if you're not here you're gonna have to deal with it there the next place you decide to go if they're a Christian church and if and, and you'll soon find out you know what I'm done with church I'm done. That, see, that's the slope. That's, that's the trajectory. That's where the problem comes. So these are just a few examples. I mean, the devil has many walls and tactics, doesn't he? And, and schemes. So how will we endure? The answer is right here, by exhorting each other. To sit under the preaching and teaching of God's word. The called meetings, be in them. Be in them. They're a means of grace. Exhort and encourage each other in the faith, in our conversations, in our friendships, and during the week, different ways. You can, you can be a blessing to the saints. Any kind of, there are many tangible ways to do this. Another translation for the Greek word here, parakaleo, is encourage. Encourage each other. This is what, let your, let your speech be seasoned with Grace. We know what grace means. You're talking to people in a way they may not necessarily deserve this kind of love and blessing and kindness. But the encouragement, we need encouragement as Christians. We're here to encourage each other. We're to be encouragers. 
Because we're not going to make it in the Christian life without encouragement. It just doesn't work that way. That's why we come together regularly. We, we meet regularly. Comfort's another word that can be applied. Comforting each other. He'll say later, do not forsake the assembly. Don't stop meeting because of this. This is what happens, this heart protection. I love the illustration of, of, of like a, a campfire. Mark LaCour gave it when he, he taught this text in 2013. Lee reminded me. And this campfire mentality is a great one because you have the logs, the wood piled, even the hot coals in the bottom. And what happens if one of those logs falls off to the side? Goes out. Anybody knows that. that. See how that illustration applies to anyone's mind. That thing's gonna go cold. It's gonna go out. It will not persevere. You see, it's gotta be back in among the, hot, the, the fire, all the rest. So that's, that's very pertinent. That's a, such a wonderful illustration. So there is really this, this undergirding principle. And, and it's this, an important remedy to an evil heart of unbelief is mutual admonition and encouragement. That's the remedy. That's the protection. Mutual encouragement. Remember what Paul said to the Romans? He was excited to get there for one reason. What? We're going to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Like you're going to encourage the apostle. Lord willing, I mean, if, if an apostle or some well-known, like someone we think is really godly, if they're here among us, they too will be encouraged because the, it's, it's the mutual thing. It's what Christians do. So this author to the Hebrews, he's a living example of this himself, isn't he? This whole book is a model for this. This is what he's doing, these exhortations, these warnings, this teaching, even these reproofs, these encouragements, these words of comfort that he brings. He's doing it. He's living it before us, which is what a, a godly man will do and, and leader. They'll live it out before you. He's doing it right here in the book of Hebrews. And he says every day. Look at that. Have you noticed that one? As long as it's called today. So this says, what does this say? Regularly, day after day, could be a way to translate it. Day after day, keep at it. Don't stop. This needs to be the pattern of the Christian life. It has to be the pattern. So right now is, is a day of grace. As we saw last time, it's a day of grace. He'll say it later while, 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 while the time is still open, basically. The door is still open. God's hands are still open towards you. It's a day of grace. Israel's quote-unquote day was 40 years. We don't know how long you, we have. 40 hours, 40 weeks, we, you might get 40 years. You don't know, that's the problem. So today, as long as it's called today, this is what we're to be about. We need to be about loving and exhorting and encouraging each other in the faith. The faith wants delivered to the saints. And we need this as we, say, we see because it's sin, sin and its hardened effects. Sin's effects could be a daily threat on any one of us. A daily threat. I think that's why he's emphasizing today, as long as it's called a day, you, this be in your heart. In verse 14, he says, We have come to share in Christ, for we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. So in this verse, he again, he's really restating the vital truth. That's why I mentioned verse 6 earlier. He's saying it again because it's very important. He says, he's, he's saying, we have come to share in Christ. Now, what a precious truth and reality that is. If we could just get our minds to lay hold of that, which Lee tried to teach three, three sermons. But come to share in Christ, you, each one of you. Share in Christ? That's right. And this, this, this is the greatest thing that could ever happen to a human being that there is, is to share in Christ. It's another way of saying 
of, of being God's house that he said, and you are his house if indeed you hold fast or God's dwelling place. So you could also say we have become partakers in him or with him. We're partners with him, even friends and companions of his, being about what he's about. You're his friend, you're his companion. Those are all true, but I think this goes deeper and speaks to our union with Christ. We are sharing in his life and in his death and in his resurrection. We are partakers with him. We're united to him. We're we're sharing in his inheritance, in his name, in all his benefits. You're you're a sharer. You're You're united with him. Eternal life. You know, he, he is a partaker, as he said in chapter 2, of your flesh and blood, of your human nature forever. And likewise, you're now a partaker and a sharer in him. And look what he says. Here, here's another conditional statement to this. You're a sharer in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. That every word in that sentence is, is critical. If. That is an if statement. If indeed we what? Hold. Hold what? Our original confidence. How do we hold? Firm. How long? To the end. See the flow there? This is saying that we have to keep believing. This is perseverance. Keep trusting. Keep depending upon Jesus. Hold firm to him in faith. That's, the, that's what holds is faith. There's, I think there's a lack of Christi- Christians thinking in terms of the need to strive or hold firm or fighting or clinging There's too much of the good-to-go mentality. This is necessary. You may get knocked down, but what do you do? You, you You keep laying hold, and you get up, and you keep striving up that narrow way. You know, our original confidence, what he's talking about there, hold to our original confidence. This speaks to the original gospel that was presented by the apostles. They heard that, the message through Christ and his apostles. Hold to that. The true gospel. And if we don't do this, it's because sin has deceived you. And your heart's grown hard. And unbelief is setting in. And then you're gone. And it's irrecoverable. As we'll see later. You're you're done. So your original confidence. Christ spoke of your first love. Don't lose that. Hold on to that. You could even say... Your baptismal confession. Hold on. Hey, remember your baptism? Remember what you said you you believed? Hold to that. Don't let go of that. Hold on to the original confession. Hold fast. And the contrast or the antithesis, again, of, 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 of holding fast is this falling away. Apostasy. So the true Christian will hold fast. They, they, they will hold tight. They, they, as the, I said, loose grips don't save. Holding loosely to the gospel or to Christ, that is, that is not going to work. This, this, yeah, I believe that. You know, it's kind of a looseness, a, kind of a, a flimsy, limp, squishy grip that won't do it, that won't save not to Christ, right? Nor will holding on temporarily. Yeah, I, I believe that, but I've let go of that. See, that, all that proves is that you were never a real Christian at all. It just exposes that. Exposes the fact that you were a pretender. You were just being religious. You really didn't hold to the truth at all. So look now how he he rifles through this series of rhetorical questions in verses 15 to 18. Like a master teacher in in biblical exegete, he's pressing home the issue 
of hardening your heart, of rebellion and its catastrophic effects. He, he repeats verse 15, how he had already said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. He repeats it, and he's gonna say it again in chapter four. But now look at these, these questions that have come, boom, 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 and they just answer each other. He says, for who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? See, it's just like boom, boom, boom. He's just taking the psalm, taking the truth of the message of the Spirit and just applying it. Who was it? Who was it? What happened? What happened? And, and this, what do you think is going to happen to you? He's letting the psalm do the work. So he's letting the, the word of God do the work in their hearts. And now he sums up the warning and exhortation in verse 19. He says, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Now, I love the subtle framing of the way he sets up verses 12 through 19. Because he starts off in verse 12 saying, he says, take care, but he could also be translated, see to it. Right? See to it, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. And look how he closes in verse 19. He says, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. See? See to it. So we see. Their problem, deep down, unbelief. The potential danger for you, unbelief. And the, the issue, you kind of expect them to say they couldn't enter because of disobedience. They disobeyed, they rebelled. But that wasn't the heart of the problem, it was unbelief. Unbelief led to the disobedience. So what unbelief does, it leads to all the mess, it leads to all the adultery, all the lies, all the pride, all of it. Unbelief is what kept the wilderness generation of Israel out of the promised land. And the greater point is that unbelief will keep you out of heaven. And, and the greater point is that unbelief will keep you out forever of this God's rest. They could not enter. You see that? They were unable to enter. Because after they rebelled, what they tried to do? They said, okay, we'll take up swords and we'll go do it. Too late. God's not with you. And they, they, Caleb and then Moses even said, don't do that. God's not with you now. No, we're going to do it. We're going. And they all, they, it was a massacre. They could not enter because they weren't going in faith or in, in belief. They're going in the strength of their own flesh. We're going to get religious, you see. We're going to turn over a new leaf. We're going to do this now. You won't. It's always by faith. I love this statement. I'm about to wrap up. Philip Hughes, commentator, originally wrote his in 1977. He devoted his commentary to D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the doctor. And he said something pretty profound here. Listen to what he said. He said, the point is that this generation, which had firsthand experience of the goodness of God in bringing them from slavery to freedom, compromised the very, I'm sorry, comprised the very last group of persons one would have ever expected to rebel against their Savior God. Still more unthinkable is the prospect of hard-hearted rebellion by professing Christians against the Lord, who at, who at the price of his own blood has ransomed them from the dark power of Satan and led them into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Yet this was precisely the danger threatening the community to whom this letter was addressed. End quote. It's the same danger for us. And, you know, that's part of teaching through scriptures. That this is, this is what's coming up right now in God's providence. And this is what we need to hear. It's the same danger. Just as they perish in the wilderness, you will perish because of unbelief. Again, 
Much of the letter to the Hebrews is a call, a summons to faith, to press on, to faith, to believe, to trust, to hope in God. Don't grow negligent or dull of hearing. Don't stop meeting together. See, don't, don't become who you're even hard to teach. You've got to go back to the milk instead of the meat. All this is coming later. But this is the idea. Faith, press on, grow, hope in God. And we want to be a people that, that loves each other and helps each other in this church. We, we want to be true Christians, true to each other, true to the Lord. Building one, one another up in the faith. We want to be those who forgive those who bear with one another in love, those who encourages and, and each other, and we press on together, even through some hard stuff. We want, to, we want to bring you along, and we'll press on together. That's how the Lord is. I'm going to bring you with, we're going on. We're going to press on. All that are his sheep. One goes astray, what does he do? He goes after that one. We're coming back. We're going on. So we want to be faithful Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. You may enter in to that rest. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed but of those who have faith and persevere and preserve their souls. So may none of us miss this glorious rest given by Christ found in him. Well, chapter four will say a lot more actually about that glorious rest, about that Sabbath rest in Christ. So that's Hebrews three. We're a quarter of the way through. Amen. Let's pray. Father, glory to your great name. You are truly good. You are worthy of our hearts. Lord, may we be a church that, that do this very thing, encourage one another, exhort one another daily while it is still called today, that no one, Lord, fall to the deceitfulness of sin. May we love, love you and love each other deeply, truly. This is sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Bless this word now to your people. In the precious name of our Savior, amen.